You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Samir, thank you for taking the time to debate today to be on this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now, for everyone at home or listening to this, Samir and I, we're actually almost neighbors. I mean, we live in the same neighborhood. I see him pretty much every time I'm going to the gym or going walking or, or who knows who knows what. And well, even though Zamir's only been in Silicon Valley a short amount of time, he's definitely entrenched himself in the community here. Every event I go to, he's a judge, he's given advice, he's, he's everywhere. So with that, could you give our audience a little bit of history of your career up into this point before we dive into the questions? Thank you for having me, Sean. It's a great pleasure. I enjoy talking to you every time we meet. There's always something new and exciting that we discuss. So I've been a serial entrepreneur for almost my entire life. And uh, I love building businesses since I was a teenager. You know, I used to, you know, sell uh, little things and uh, go here and there. And then uh, when I was in, in college, I would uh, prepare special materials and reports for other students so they can get better grades. Because, you know, I used to like download stuff uh, from internet, uh, rework it, you know, print it out. I had a buddy who had a large printer at his, at his work. So he would print those things out for me. So I, I always hustled and did different things. Uh, and um, I also had a chance to work in the United States uh, when I was young. When I was only 19, I came here to kind of roam around as a student and, and try different things. So. Um, and uh, after going back to, to my homeland where I was born, uh, I started different businesses. And um, around 2009, I ended up working for a company running large events, um, you know, with, uh, with business people, with uh, politicians, presidents of countries, etc. And uh, one of the things I really enjoy doing is running events with startups and with uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We did hackathons, we did all kinds of pitch events, and I got kind of sucked into the ecosystem of these amazing, talented people who were building products, who were creating startups, you know, venture capital and all of these things. And uh, around 2014, me and my partners, we started a company which, which was called uh, GVA, Global Venture Alliance. And we started building accelerators in Eastern Europe, CIS region. You know, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Armenia, all those, all those countries, we would bring Silicon Valley experts, professionals, and that was the age where all these methodologies came along, like customer development, lean startup, you know, business modeling. So we started bringing experts from the United States to that part of the world and training entrepreneurs how to build you know, successful, scalable startups. I've been doing that for the past 10 years before I launched my uh, fund, which is now operating here in, in Silicon Valley. It's called Vibranium VC. So when you're building these accelerators, from my understanding, I think you've built 42, 42 plus accelerators in that time. What were some of the lessons that you learned, some of the takeaways that say someone in another country or another city or anywhere that they want to do an accelerator, what are some some insights you can share with them from your experience. So the, the best thing uh, we started doing is we, we figured that you don't have to build a bicycle. There are methodologies and practices out there in the world, especially when it comes to advanced ecosystems like Silicon Valley, that you can just take and adapt for your local market. Uh, you can't just copycat. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way because there's always, you know, different economic situations, different backgrounds of people who come and try to build startups. Uh, let's say in that region, the CIS region, people are very technical. A lot of good mathematicians, programmers, developers, but their skill uh, on the business side is a bit lower. So we had to create programs to teach them how to do the product market fit, how to build marketing strategy, how to do sales, you know, how to pitch, because they were very product oriented rather than business oriented. So. Um, that was one thing we started doing. We figured, okay, you know, we ba we take the best um, practices out there, we implement them here, and we help these founders to start thinking global and go to global market once they're ready. Once they've conquered some audience in their local markets, then we would help them, you know, scale uh, to different countries. So with that, you got a, to meet a lot of companies, a lot of startups. And I'm guessing that 
has really helped you right now with your well, current VC fund. So how do you go about picking companies? How do you go about saying, okay, they got something that, that piques my interest? Yeah, absolutely. This um, work with many startups, and we counted over 1,200 alumni startups from our acceleration programs. Uh, I personally coached a lot of them and worked with them. So I uh, got my you know hands inside of their operations and business models and all of these different things. Now it's allowing me, whenever we look at potential deals, I can really scan as an MRI what's going on with a startup and, and see you know, where they, they have gray zones and where, you know, they need some improvement and some help. One of the key uh, takeaways that, you know, we have is we want to be a help to the startup. We don't want just to invest money. We want to make sure that we can add value and uh, help them grow in, you know, in those areas where they are lacking some experience or they just maybe too focused on certain things. Uh, I, I noticed this that where, you know, founders, they're all thinking about, you know, product, how the product should be amazing. And this is great. But in order to be successful, you have to build a business around the product. And especially when it comes to an early dialogue with investors, founders who, who don't have experience of previous exits and previous startups, they don't know a lot of things that are happening behind the closed doors. So whenever we look at things, and of course, one of the first and most important things we notice is we look at the founding team, whether this team and um, uh, you know has all the proper uh, skill set, knowledge, and motivation to make this a successful company. So when you're first, I'm guessing you're analyzing then the founders, but are there any metrics or anything that these companies should know about? Should start tracking? Should start setting goals to get to yeah absolutely we when we talk about seed stage uh, companies we look at different things of course there's not too many metrics to look at uh, to look for uh, because they're just starting you know to to sell their product that might have um you know a few hundred thousand dollars in annual in annualized revenue so mm, we want to make sure that they understand that everything they can measure it's always good to measure because if you can measure it, you can improve it. Even if it's a vanity metric, like, you know, how many people come to their website, uh, you know, how many clicks, how many uh, downloads, installations, and all of these metrics should be measured in order to understand what kind of actions uh, should be taken to improve any of these. And whenever they have a dialogue with the investor, they would point out what is important. When we look at the startup, one of the important things for us is early revenues. Because early revenues, they prove that this product is needed and the customer is willing to pay for it. Whatever it is, it can be $5. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the price is. And we all know that these companies are not profitable in the beginning. So that's okay. As long as we see that the market is actually betting on this product with, with dollars. The second important metric would be the speed of growth. Sometimes founders take a long time. They bootstrap. They they, um, they try kind of to build it themselves rather than um, attracting a, a venture capital or a business angel in the early stage. And it takes them much longer, typically two or three times slower um, uh, compared to if they raise uh, venture capital for faster growth. So we, we want the startup to, to grow at least you know, 3x in the past year so we would consider that startup a venture startup, not just a regular small business. Um, uh, also, that 3x, yeah. is that from idea to pre-seed, pre-seed to seed, seed to A, A to B? Where does that 3x lie? Between pre-seed and seed. Typically in the pre-seed stage, they start selling. They might have, I don't know, fifty, dollars $100,000 annualized. So by the time they come to raise seed stage, it would be good if they had around half a million dollars worth of revenue, annualized revenue. Uh, if it's recurring, it's even better when it comes to our focus, which is the B2B SaaS. So uh, that way they would show that they grew from like 100, 150K a year to 400, 450, 500K, which is a 3, 3x growth. And that would uh, point out that 
you know, these um, folks, you know, the co-founders, they understand what they're doing. They found the early product market fit. Uh, they can scale fast enough. Uh, and now they need just a little more fuel in order to grow even faster, get to their Series A metrics. So going back to just the founding team and, and looking at them and those first few employees, how can a company, when they really have no money, say they don't have money, say they didn't have a successful exit in the past or the rich uncle that's the hedge fund manager or, or who knows, how do they go about attracting the best talent to build the company? So one of the very common things that was created in uh, Silicon Valley is you know, options. So um, basically you offer somebody a potential future success and you say, hey, if you believe in my mission, if you believe in my idea, I'm going to give you shares of this company if you, if you stick around and, and help me build this. And then we, we can all become millionaires you know, uh, at one point. So I think that was uh, the key differentiator between what was happening in Silicon Valley and elsewhere in the world. So this tool of options and offering early stock to um, core team was something to attract the best talent. I think one of the things that is important for the founders, first of all, of course, is um, hiring the best. So they need to have this capability of convincing people belief in their idea, in their um, mission of whatever they want to build. Second thing, they need to have an ability to sell to the best, meaning, you know, either large corporations, big companies, big brand names, um, you name it, like s s some significant customers out there. And the third important thing that balances that out is having an ability to raise money from the best, from top tier investors, from top super angels, you know, somebody uh, with a, a good uh, and a long track record that could uh, could could be the star investor, and then everybody else would come along. So if a founder or a founding team can do those three things, that is a potential champion. So say the founding team, they don't have the connections to the investors, they don't have the network, maybe they're not here in Silicon Valley, or who knows, and they hear about crowdfunding and the option of crowdfunding, what are your thoughts for crowdfunding? Is that a good idea? Does that, if you see a company that had done a successful crowd run, crowdfunding campaign in the past come to you later on, is that something that excites you, doesn't bother you? What are your thoughts when you hear about that? So crowdfunding is a pretty new tool that came along you know, a few years ago, and it typically works very well with consumer products, let's say wearable devices or something that is like a B2C business model. Um, I think it's a good testing platform where you can get pre-orders and support from investors with, I don't know, $100 checks. Uh, one of the things I would suggest uh, startups to be careful about is how the eventual uh, investment is structured inside of the cap table. Because whenever we see a cap table with like 100 plus investors, each one of them put in 500 to five thousand dollars, that's a messy cap table, and typically uh, VCs don't like to work with companies like that. So, so could what, you dive yeah. into that? Why don't they like to work with companies? Like, what are the repercussions? I would say, or the um, the challenges of having so many investors on a cap table so early on. Yeah. No offense to anybody, but among VCs, that kind of cap table where you have like 100 plus investors and you're still seed stage, uh, it's called a zoo of, of investors because um, too many people have, you know, very small stake in the company. Like whenever they convert into, into real, uh, real equity, that would be like 0 0.0 some percent for each one of them. One of the big problems and issues a founder will have is communicating and reporting to all of those investors. That's something that VCs don't like because even if a person invested $1,000 into you, they are eligible to ask you questions saying, hey, you know, how is my investment doing? Are you growing? So that distracts the founder a lot, all of those communications. So one of the advices we typically give to people before they do that, we say, okay, create a special purpose vehicle and allow those small investors in and put their money into the special purpose vehicle as a sole body. And that will go into your cap table eventually. And I've seen founders do that and 
they raised even a couple millions of dollars like that, which is great. But they don't have to report to 150 people with small checks. They report to the SPV, and the SPV manager then you know, handles the rest of the communication. I think that's probably the key. And again, sometimes people who invest through crowdfunding campaigns, they don't realize what it is to invest in a startup and that this is not a liquid inv investment and you have to, your money will stay there for like, I don't know, eight, 10 years maybe. And so sometimes they're like, hey, I really need my thousand dollars back, please, you know, and there's no way to kind of get this money out back to the, so those, those happen and we would want it uh, for a founder to be a bit shielded from that kind of communication, not to distract the team from their efforts to build the company. That's why we always suggest create an SPV with all the small investors into, into that SPV and allow the SPV manager handle the communication. And you just, you know, you just work with them directly. That's it. Do you find that a lot of founders get distracted easily by reporting to either investors or just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of seeing right now, you know, in my inbox, how many emails I get every day. I can only imagine if I had 200 investors asking me questions and then trying to also fundraise at the same time. And all that. I mean, how big of a problem is this distraction to founders you've talked to? One of the key problems here is the time. Every message you send consumes your time. Every email you have to read and reply consumes your time. And you cannot ignore these people because they invested money into you. And I, what I noticed a lot of times, the smaller investors, they require more attention than the ones that put couple millions into you right uh, because these guys are professionals they have portfolio management and you know they they don't do these typically out of their pocket small investors are like angels they invest their own money rather than vcs who operates a larger fund and invests lps money so in in these situations we definitely uh try to explain to the founders uh, of course the importance of keeping up with everything and 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 uh, replying but try to minimize that kind of disturbance because we want the founders to be focused on building the product, building the company, uh, ch uh, chasing customers, you know, uh, s selling, doing all of that. Because in, in any given day, customer money is better than investors' money. So we say, okay, you got to go out there and focus on the business. And even when it comes to a new fundraising campaign, we always say, okay, designate, I don't know, three months. Like put a time frame on your fundraising and focus, you know, on, on raising the next round in, inside of that time frame and try to finish it, close it and move on to your original job, you know, as the CEO to kind of do the strategy, grow the company, build the team, all of these important things. Because fundraising is a very time consuming. For the communication part, quick question for our audience out there that may have not raised any funding so far. Do they have to report for, say they raised from a safe note, a convertible note, or is this just a crowdfunding thing where they have to report to everyone or answer questions when people have them? For non-professional investors, it's not obvious that even if they invested a thousand, uh, when they invest small amounts of money, that the reporting and their rights are a bit different from large investors. Because they're, they're, they don't live in this world where, you know, for instance, we uh, understand the differences between the major investor and anybody else in the round, the lead investor and anybody else in the round. The more, inv the more money you put into the company, the more rights you get, right? Uh, the better deal you get. Uh, so the smaller investors, because they're not professionals in the field and they do it just out of uh, you know, excitement, joy, interest to kind of be part of this uh, world, uh, they just want to know more and uh, typically they don't abide by the common rules that okay it's a quarterly reporting we just get this nice report from the founder and they tell us uh, whatever they want to share with us and we don't really bother them if they don't need any help from us so uh, that notion comes only when when you work uh, on a daily basis with with the startups and you understand that your key role is not to get in the way you know, as, as an investor, you need to give as much support as you can to the founder without bugging or bothering them with, with questions and uh, kind of sidetracking them to keep communicating with you. So before you had mentioned the 3x growth between pre-seed and seed, 
Are there any other metrics that companies should be tracking as they hit different stages in their in their growth from seed to A, A to B? Any numbers you like to see? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we always want to understand what was the previous fundraising history. Uh, some of some of the founders they raise too much money too early, so they dilute themselves, uh, basically giving up, um, you know, more than twenty percent of their company on the pre seed, which is a bad sign. The reason why it's bad is that by the time they get to Series A, they might lose control of the company, so they would have less than 50% of the company. And later stage investors, they don't appreciate that. They, they believe that the motivation of the founders will be not, not enough to drive this to success, to a unicorn status, to a global company. So um, founders should be very careful uh, about early fundraising, even if money is out there and available for them to raise. They should be cautious about how much they really need because the... Um, valuation of the company is low so you know they would have to give up too much of the equity for for smaller amount of of money so we always um, ask them to watch for that uh, typical size of the round should not exceed 20 percent of uh, uh, dilution in the round so pre-seed round not more than 20 percent seed round not more than 20 percent and series a same thing um, that's one of the metrics they should follow also, uh, there is a metric that not many investors talk about, but we look at it. It's called a capital consumption index, which means is how much revenue will you generate from each dollar that was invested in the company. So when it comes to pre-seed, we say that a capital con- consumption, a good capital consumption should be one-to-one, meaning you get a $500,000 worth of investment into you in pre-seed stage, you generate $500,000 worth of uh, revenue. That's good. When you come to seed stage, that number doubles. So if you attract 1.5 million on the seed stage or 2 million on the seed stage, by the time you get to Series A within 18 months or so, um, you should be generating you know, 3 to $4 million worth of revenue. And that's a good capital consumption index. So uh, I, sometimes I notice that founders say, okay, uh, we're raising $2 million seed round. We're going to get to $1 million uh, worth of revenue with that money. So that's $1 to 50 cents, which is not a very good deal for an investor. So we, we understand that there are some kind of issues inside a company, whether it's a high burn rate, they burn too much money. By the way, burn rate on a seed stage should be somewhere around not exceeding $80,000, maybe up to $100,000. So whenever we see a startup that is burning $150,000, 10-people team, raising their seed stage, something is off here. Or and they're, they might be wasting too much money on you know, marketing, advertising, shooting, and all these different channels. That means lack of focus. So we try to watch for things like that and make sure that founders are cautious and careful about the money they're raising and spending, especially in the time of crisis like this, uh, you gotta really cut the things that are not important. Focus, like laser focus. You know, put all the resources to kind of get the, your core uh, beachhead customers. And this is all with SaaS companies, correct? Because I'm guessing each sector probably has different metrics that that those investors are tracking and that consumption rate and everything else. So. Actually, before even moving forward with any other questions, just to give the audience a basis, can you talk about your VC fund a little bit more and, and set that as the base for all the answers moving forward? Absolutely. Um, so we have a um, seed stage fund. Uh, we invest in B2B SaaS companies on, on the seed, sta- seed stage. Our sweet spot is uh, up to $500,000 uh, in our first check. We typically follow on the best companies that we invested in with a larger check, uh, up to 1.5 million on Series A. We have a few companies coming up in Q3 from the portfolio that are working on their Series A right now. And we just started investing a year ago, so we're not that that far uh, into the game yet. But I've been around uh, the market for so long, so we kind of set these rules out there. 
And we did mention the few metrics that the speed of growth that we like to see, like 3x, the speed of growth. Mm, you know, then we, we dig into their financial models on these other things. Uh, but uh, we've focused a uh, few verticals out of all the B2B SaaS because it's a very big market. So we, we focused on productivity tools like business productivity, uh, etc. We look at fintech. Uh, we understand fintech well. Uh, we also look at sales and marketing tools and uh, things that work in the media and entertainment space because I, I think it's an exciting space as well with you know all the movies and gaming and all these other things and um, a lot of these software uh, that is build, being built uh, they are basically digitalizing uh, conservative fields and you know old kinds of businesses uh, changing their business models and uh, when we worked and built these accelerators in the past one of the key roles that we had is we would find these big businesses and then we would investigate what kind of problems they have in their processes and uh, the way they run things. And then we would find innovative uh, software solutions and help implement them inside of these large businesses and scale. So that was the model. So we really understand pretty well how to avoid these bureaucratic barriers inside big corporations, how to engage the team inside to run pilots with startups and then how to scale those that's the reason why we chose the vertical of p2p SaaS. and then with that when you're looking at these companies there's one thing when i was doing the research for this interview that was interesting to me the 6t methodology that you guys implement can you talk a little bit about that so that's a methodology that was created by some of our friends in, in stanford uh, it's an overall methodology, but we use it um, in a form of a cabinet analysis in the very beginning of, of our journey, you know, with the startup of our diligence. So the 6T stands for, you know, the team is number one, TAM, so the market size. So first you look at the team, make sure it's, a, it's an A team, right? Uh, uh, champions, potential champions that you can bet on. Second, the TAM is the market size, you know, how, uh, how big is the market? Um, whether it's a growing market, how fast it's growing, whether it's uh, over um, uh, crowded with the competition or it's a blue ocean, etc. So we, we check we check those things. Then we look at the traction, right? The traction is the metrics that I, that I mentioned before. We we'll also look at the at the trends, um, supporting trends. Is this something that is going to keep you know continuing and happening, right? Is it affected by any my, macroeconomic um, things that are happening in the world? I don't like COVID or war or uh, tsunami or whatever. Whatever is happening out there, uh, is this technology going along with it, with the trend or not? Uh, then we we'll, finally we look at the terms uh, with uh, terms of the deal, and uh, we make sure that it fits. You know the valuation cap of the startup, the size of the round. Uh, whether they have a lead investor or they don't, uh, what other terms uh, they, they provide, and how the, the round is structured. Because a lot of times we see safes uh, as, uh, as a tool to structure the round, and investors, everybody understands that safe is created for speed, but it takes away some rights, and some other ways of structuring the deal is actually better sometimes even for the founders, because they might lose some sort, sort of control uh, if they just do the safe. That's, that's interesting, the, the structure of the deal. If you'd like to dive in on that more, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. If not, let's go right into a little bit more of the due diligence. I'm curious what goes into the financial due diligence part. Financial due diligence uh, covers uh, several things. First of all, we uh, ask startup to share with us their you know, P&L, their cash flow statements, their financial model. We'll look at everything, how it matches up. So we want to make sure that uh, startups, they understand the basically financial management well enough and they can uh, leverage the money that is coming in. And they, you know, we, we can see whether there are potential problems in the future, whether they're going to have cash shortages or whether they are raising too much right now. They don't really need that much. So we would give them an advice and suggestion saying, okay, you know, maybe you should uh, do a lower, lower, a smaller round right now because to get to your KPIs that you want it, you will, you know, this will be enough. Also, we look at the bank statements and the situation with reporting. 
how they're doing reporting, how they're, you know, if they're paying taxes or not, etc. That, that is uh, also uh, an important piece of the financial due diligence because uh, we match whatever is in the Excel spreadsheets with the, with the bank statements, and we want to make sure that everything is properly and correctly done. And overall, uh, we also look at their pipeline for the clients. We look at the existing contracts uh, to see who, who they're working with and what are they selling at what price. And we look at the, at the pipeline of the, of the customers to see the potential for growth. Because if, if uh, a startup is claiming that they will make $3 million worth of revenue within the next 12, month, 12 months, but inside of their pipeline, they have only you know, $1 million worth of, of customers at the point You'll be asking questions like, okay, guys, you know, you need to extend the pipeline. So all of these things and their potential financial growth has to match also what they're doing in marketing, in sales, in the product development. So we try to kind of synchronize everything and, and make sure that we believe this plan that, that the founders have. So we look at the track record. So the track record proves that they're capable of doing what they're claiming to do. Uh, growing the business, selling, closing contracts, etc. But the track record is pretty short, maybe 12 months worth of sale. But then they are promising us something for the next five years, right? We're going to get to 100 millions worth of revenue. And we, we try to kind of match and see whether this is a believable plan and whether our support would be something that is you know, uh, needed at the point. You mentioned you know, making sure that they're paying their taxes and everything else. Where, where are you seeing the, the skeletons appear in your due diligence? Where are you seeing the problems that you're uncovering going, wait a second, something, there's a red flag here? A lot of red flags appear in terms of IP and the rights because startups, they don't really think about those uh, early, er, early stage, early in, into building the product. And they change uh, developers, you know, people come in and out of the team. They build pieces of the of the uh, code, and they don't have proper paperwork to transfer that, and that potentially might create really big problems with uh, with a startup, especially if somebody built I don't know twenty five percent of the product and then they left and they they kind of were unhappy about uh, leaving the startup. So potentially that is a, a legal problem in the future. Mm, we see a mismanagement of of finances, meaning not that. The founders are like getting buying Ferraris or anything. No, they don't have that much money in the beginning, but they don't know and they don't see the clear picture about what's happening with money in the company. So they kind of lack uh, experience, or they never had, or they don't have a CFO on uh, you know <laughs> in the team, and uh, they have maybe an extended accountant outsourcing that that part, but they don't manage the resources prop properly. One time we found $150,000 missing in a startup. I'm like, how can you be missing $150,000 in an early seed startup? I mean, this is a lot of money. You should, you should know where that kind of money uh, is going. So whenever we conduct the, the diligence process, we try to help founder to see these gray zones, to see these red flags ahead of a time. It's not uh, just to kind of say no to the deal. But when we outline these risks, we put them in a, in a form of you know, high risks, medium risks, and low risks. If, if there's high risks, we try to help founder to fix them before you know, uh, it, gets, it gets worse. Because whenever a problem exists for a longer time, it, it, you know, it gets worse and sometimes it's not possible to correct it. Especially when it comes to authorities. Let's say you file taxes, you did something that it was wrong. That's very hard to, to return. And you're going to get fined and you're going to get in trouble. Uh, we want to make sure that founders abide by the law. They do everything by the book. So they don't get uh, sidetracked into problem solving when they really need to focus on building their company. Can you give an example of a high risk, a red, uh, a medium risk? I'm guessing that's yellow. Uh, well, I'm not sure if there'd be a no risk or a low risk. Low risk, yeah. But like example of each sure. of those. So the high risk would be uh, missing IP rights, miss, missing pieces of that. A high risk would be signing a very strange 
uh, investment contract with an investor, giving the early investor way too many rights. Um, let's say we had the situation where a startup signed uh, an investment um, the paperwork with uh, with an early angel. The angel invested 100K, but one article said that any round larger than $1 million have to be uh, a written consent from this investor. So these guys, they were raising their two and a half million seed stage round, already one and a half committed and signed when we came in. And we found this contract, we analyzed it, we saw this article, we're like, guys, do you have the written consent from this investor? They're like, what? We, so they didn't even know about this article. They didn't remember it. Uh, so basically what can happen in a situation like this, this is reversible. So any investment they would attract eventually into the company could be reversed by this initial investor saying, I did not give a consent. I did not sign anything allowing you to raise that money. So give all that money back. This, this can happen as a potential risk. So that would be a red risk, right? Where we say, okay, this can reverse everything you do and hurt all the investors along the way. Um, when it comes to yellow risks, typically it's uh, mismatching in reporting some, some things that should be corrected, or let's say uh, the quality of their PL or the quality of their financial model is not up to the standards. So we say, guys, we take this as is, but please, this is the uh, draft financial model, model according to the standards in the market. Please use this draft and rework whatever you have right now. Um, and the low risk would be something um, maybe they, are, they haven't registered a trademark yet, for example. We're like, guys, this is a low risk, but you should start working on this thing right now. Maybe register a trademark, maybe register your logo. Uh, and you know potentially not to have any issues with anybody so you have to change your name you know in the middle of your fast growth and that happens a lot with startups by the way so all this due diligence how much time do you take to do that and do you find you go deeper than probably many of the other investors out there that's what we hear uh we do go deeper definitely it takes around two months to from the day we started the dialogue with a startup all the way to the moment we uh, vote in our investment committee to invest in them. Right now, we're flipping uh, the process a little bit. We want to first vote and provide the term sheet to the founder, get get interested, get an agreement that we want to come in with certain uh, 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 structure of the deal. And then uh, we move the due diligence to the very last stage focusing on the deal breakers. So we will tell them about some yellow and, and green things that are happening, but it will not affect our decision if there's no like really heavy deal breakers. And one of the key deal breakers for us is if the founding team was lying about important things like money, you know, revenues, contracts, or you know, IP rights, something. Uh, if, if, if it's a little mismatch, we're fine. We understand that. It happens. Uh, but if it's something severe, I can give you an example of one of the things that happened. One of the founders told us that uh, it, was, it was a lady. She had a contract signed with a big customer, which would bring her startup up to $50,000 monthly recurring revenue. And that was great. I said, wow, early stage, a big contract like that, amazing. And that... Um, was a um, basis to have certain kind of uh, valuation for the startup, right? Because you have that revenue, it's already signed, great. So, you know, we believe that your valuation is as high as you say. Eventually, when we did the due diligence, we asked, could you provide this contract to us to kind of verify that it exists? Uh, it was not provided, then we asked again. Uh, so they provided us with a letter of intent from that customer for a pilot for ten thousand dollars, we said, guys, this is a very big mismatch. You said you have a contract with fifty thousand dollars recurring revenue every month, and now you're providing us only with a letter of intent for ten thousand one-time payment for a pilot. It's not even about the scaling. So that was a deal breaker, unfortunately, because you cannot make up things like that and and lie to an investor to get to get money with a high valuation and then eventually not not support it with the documentations. 
And we have to be careful because we are responsible as a GP for money of our investors. We cannot just, it, no matter how much we like the founder, the idea, the technology that they're building, we want to make sure that the deal is clean, it's, it's, it's good, you know, everything is checked, this is a good entity, all the IP rights are there, because we are investing in the IP rights, right? We are investing in the company that should own the product. Otherwise, what are you investing in, really? What happens, you mentioned the investment committee and changing it from the end of due diligence to now the beginning. What happens in an investment committee meeting? Typically, it's a one-hour meeting where we invite the founder. So uh, by the time we come to the investment committee, the GP team already put together a very comprehensive memo with all the data about the startup. You know, the customer segments, the market, um, the metrics, uh, the future potential growth, team, we talk about the team, the business model, all of it is in the memo. So it's about you know six plus pages memo that we provide to members of investment committee. I'm also a member of an investment committee. I have a voting, uh, I'm a voting member. So we take that, uh, uh, we provide that to the members to read beforehand and investigate everything, read everything, look at the pitch deck, look at the demo of the product. We invite the founder, uh, we give them a certain form of uh, information that we wanted them to present. So they come to this meeting, they have about 25 to 30 minutes of pitching and demoing the product. So we really like to see live demo because these products are software, so it's okay to do like over a Zoom meeting. They can show us how this product delivers value to their customers. And then we have a Q&A session. We would ask them additional questions if there's something missing from the from their presentation. After that, we thank them. They leave the uh, the meeting room, and we have internal discussion. We go over all the findings that we had. Uh, I mean, the GP uh, uh, team, and then we go over the terms of uh, of the deal, saying whether why we believe this is a good deal. Right? So we kind of explain our position. They, you know, a good valuation, good terms, and we offer to discuss a certain check size. Typically, the decision on the check size, I mean, we come up with a proposal uh, and we look at the structure of the round, how much money was raised, what is our maximum, what we want to really bet in the first step. Because in our strategy, our, initial, our, our main investment is the follow-on. So the first check is really a bet, right? So you're kind of testing the waters, but at the same time, you want to have enough leverage in the dialogue with the startup uh, to do a larger check in the next round. You, you want to have the pro rata. You want to have an ability to invest again if these guys are really champions and growing fast. So it's always a, a balance between how much risk are we willing to take? Are we willing to risk half a million dollars? And how much leverage and ownership we want to have inside a company depending on their valuation? And also looking at how other investors are putting their money in. Like what is the lead investor's check? What is a number two check, et cetera? So we want to kind of be there, number two, number three, right behind the lead investor with a size of investment to have almost the same rights as the lead investor, as the major investor, because that, that allows us to help startups better in the future. In this com committee meeting, during that 25, 30 minute presentation, does the founders, do the startup, do they get to ask any questions or are they always on the receiving end that entire time? Absolutely, they, they can. Uh, but because before the investment committee, we have two interviews with the founders. So we have an investment manager interview. They can ask questions about the fund, about the process, about anything. And uh, on stage four, there is an interview with me as a GP of the fund. Uh, it's about two hours. So, and I always give startup like maybe 15, 20 minutes in the end to ask me any questions they want about us. And they ask me questions about how do we support our portfolio companies, you know, what kind of checks, how the process looks like, what do we prefer, et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, a lot of time, even before the investment committee, for the founders to ask questions towards the fund. Well, what questions do you like them to ask you? One of the important questions I believe every founder should ask them is what this investor can bring to them besides the money. 
what kind of support they can give him because um, I believe in uh, in a long term relationships and building this relationship should be mutually beneficial, not just like hey here's my money and that's it I'm not going to show up ever again. Uh, investor should be actively supporting uh, his portfolio companies with network, you know, connections, uh, some experience, some mentorship, you know, maybe visibility. This is what we do with our companies, for example. We help them with some articles and some blogs and some media. We help them to get like a stand on TechCrunch or uh, a pitch inside of a competition. So because we have, we're building these relationships with these organizations. So that, that's the question that should be definitely asked for sure. The second question should be asked uh, whether the startup is in the focus of, of the fund. Um, because um, if uh, a lot of funds, they have a certain vertical expertise, which are important for the startup to rely on as well, whenever they're building their strategies out. So if, if that's a match between what startup is doing and what uh, um, investors are experienced in, that's great because that, that's also uh, a, a good support to, to the growth of the startup. Um, yeah, I think those, those few questions are important to ask. But pretty much anything else, I've been asked first, even personal questions by the startups about you know, my hobbies, about my family, about what I like to do. Because they want to see a human side of an investor as well. They want to understand that there is a match in values. There is a match in things people like or dislike. Uh, but I've never been asked, by the way, any political questions. <laughs> so for this whole process, with all the companies you're, you're meeting, you're talking to, what percentage would you say actually makes it through this entire funnel to get a check? Are we talking... 50% or are we talking like 0.0001%? Where, where is it? I actually it? have that number because uh, as a marketing professional in the past, uh, I like to measure things. So far, we had close to 600 companies in our pipeline for, for a year that we've been active in investing. And our conversion rate is 1.5%, close to that, into an investment. We closed 10 deals. Um, some of them are startups, some of them are other funds that we invested in. So that's, that's the way it works. Those and would you ones. say that's typical for VCs in the Valley? Is that a high rate? Just to paint the picture for, because we have listeners all over and some of them think, and I've gotten these questions and it still surprises me. Hey, when I land in SFO, is there going to be a check waiting for me? Of course. You can pick up money right in the airport, right? Now, I think uh, 1%, 2% conversion is pretty typical in, in, in VCs. Of course, when you talk about early stage angels who put in like small checks, I don't know, $25,000, $50,000, their process is much shorter. Their decision, even if it's like a solo VC, like a smaller fund, their decision making process is shorter, quicker. They look at less uh, data about a startup. They make decisions faster because their checks are smaller. For us, because we invest half a million, you know, we, we want to be responsible. And again, we try to find this balance. So there's three parts of it. The quality of our diligence, the speed of our diligence, and the price of our diligence. So right now, the quality is very good. We share our diligence with other seed stage funds. They're like, oh, wow, you, you guys are doing like 60% more than we've done uh, when you check, you know, different things. The uh, price of our diligence is also good. We have a broad network of experts worldwide. So we can find really good experts, uh, not as expensive as they would be, let's say, in Silicon Valley, to evaluate the technology, you know, financials, legal, all of these different aspects of the startup. Now we do the KYC. Sometimes we, we do uh, competitive analysis. So all of these things we do on our, our time and our money. A startup is not paying a penny for that. So it's covered by us. One of the things that we're uh, trying to improve is the speed. So we want to continue doing it high quality, uh, decent, decent uh, cost, and better speed to have a less than two months. Because what we notice is with our presence in the Valley, with a developing of our relationship, we're getting better deals. We're getting you know, better quality startups, better quality founders coming to us to raise money. 
And those founders typically don't wait that much. Their rounds close quick. Um, they move fast. So we have to kind of be uh, at the same speed level. And that's what we're working on at this moment. Fantastic. And if our audience wants to find out more about you, what you're working on, what's the best way to go about doing that? And also, before closing up, any words of wisdom, any takeaways that you want the audience to go, okay, that's something I, I, I got to keep in the back of my mind moving forward. One of the um, advices I would like to give to the founders is pitch deck and pitching itself is only the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's something that would help you to get into the door and start the dialogue with an investor. I even built a special slide uh, that I could share to explain what happens beyond the pitch. Because a lot of times founders are very focused on building a great deck and being able to go over their startup in three minutes, which is good. But they're lacking the rest of the steps and knowledge on you know, everything that is happening um, behind the closed doors, how the due diligence process is uh, being operated, you know, what kind of questions will, they will be asked during the interviews and what kind of um, information should be present in the data room. And that, unfortunately, uh, kills the deal uh, because, yeah, the pitch can be great and you've been practicing it well uh, going through accelerators, but then after you come into a dialogue with an investor, you don't have answers or you take way too long to answer those questions and which hurts your and blows around fast enough. So my advice would be definitely investigate beyond the pitching and maybe uh, designate 5-10% of your time to a great pitch and then 90% of your time to building everything else that is needed to quickly and effectively close deals with investors. Uh, and uh, as answering your second question about uh, what we focus on, we try to be an active player in the ecosystem. That's the reason why I participate in different events and my colleagues in the teams, we go there, uh, judge, support, speak, uh, you know, share our knowledge and some of our, I can call it a little bit of wisdom because we've seen so many startups uh, and um, they're all typical mistakes, right? All typical mistakes. So if we can help startup avoid a mistake and save one month of their time by doing so we're happy to do that mm, recently we launched this uh, charity project together with the Podari Life Fund um, where I designate my time to consult the startup let's say half an hour call or one hour lunch and that startup donates money for that uh, consultation. Consultation is free, I don't charge any money, but I ask, answer any questions they, they wanna know and help them you know, with whatever problem they have and they donate money to the fund. So uh, th this way we support the children that uh, this fund is, is, is helping. I help the startups and I get satisfaction of just doing uh, something good. Mm. Also, we are launching our second soft lending program for foreign founders because being immigrants ourselves we understand how difficult it is uh, to to build not only your business in a new country but also your life also you know your family your friends you gotta make new connections you come maybe from a different cultural background different language background uh, from you know you had a different set of, uh, of of things around you in a different country so building that program we're trying to help foreign founders soft landing united states and be more successful in their efforts to build a startup here and how can people get in contact or find out more about it the best thing is you know we we update everything on our website vibranium.vc we also are pretty active in linkedin uh just recently i talked to my colleagues saying okay we need to uh be more active in twitter as well to uh, let people know about what we do. But LinkedIn is the best. Our page is there. We always talk about new uh, projects that we're launching, investments that we're doing. Uh, we try to share some tips about the fundraising and uh, uh, some advice on how to be more successful in doing so. Fantastic. We're going to have that information in the show notes. And for our audience out there, when I'm not the host of the Silicon Valley podcast, I'm an investment banker focused on mergers, acquisitions, growth capital, and secondaries. Please connect with me on LinkedIn at Sean Flynn, S-H-A-W-N-F-L-Y-N-N. 
And go to the website, thesiliconvalleypodcast.com, where you'll have this interview, our past, and what we're working on in the future. All the information's right there. And with that, Samir, I got to thank you. This has been an amazing interview. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with everyone. And I look forward to getting you back on the show in the future. Thank you for having me. Always happy to share.